So this is a pretty fun presentation for me because it's given by a person who shared a zygote with me <laughs> at the earliest phase of our lives. My sister, my twin sister, Jamie Cornelius. She is a professor at Oregon State University. She got her bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of Washington and her PhD from UC Davis in animal behavior. And she has since been doing field research uh, all over the American West, more or less, um, on, on uh, migratory birds. And she's going to talk a lot about that, so I'm not going to get into that. But I'm super proud of this woman because she has really taken science to task. She's a Fulbright scholar that was invited to study in St. Petersburg. She's worked for the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology in Germany and uh, has a deepest respect for. Her inquisitive mind and her ability to really get things done and feel, you'll see how hard it is in the presentation. So, welcome, Jane. Hi, Clint. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thanks for hearing about birds today. Next year, Ferricule Oak uh, Partnership Talks. Um, so, yeah, I've been at OSU now for about five years. And before that, I was at Eastern Michigan University. Um, I love places had a lot of amazing, you know, experiences and, and journeys along the way. Um, and have started to kind of amass, I guess, a a, a story <laughs> um, about how birds cope with hardships. It's one of the one of the themes that kind of ties my work together and, and the different projects that happen in my lab um, is unpredictability in environments and what kinds of um, adaptations birds might have to cope with those kinds of, of changes. But I want to start by uh, uh, showing a more familiar change. Um, we're all familiar with this one. Um, and kind of just gone through this transition from summer to the time with kind of plenty and warmer weather and generally easier conditions for many animals. Um, through the fall and into the winter when things get um, cold, right? So endothermic animals uh, like birds and, and mammals, us, um, this is a lot more challenging and you need to find a lot more energy in order to survive conditions like this at a time when food is often harder to find. And so we all know that these are challenging um, conditions for animals to cope with, um, but thankfully animals have evolved um, a lot of different strategies. So what we see are in the North Temperate Zone where we live are these strong seasons. And the seasons are really driven by changes in total period, which is just day length. Um, and the change in day length drives large changes in temperature, precipitation, um, and those things change primary productivity and biomass, insect biomass, plant biomass, things that are available for animals to use. Um, and these happen on the seasonal cycle. And because of that, then these seasonal cycles create seasonal cycles of risk for animals that are trying to survive, and plants that are trying to survive those conditions. So, um, you know, period of time where you have a higher risk of um, exhaustion and starvation, uh, sickness, reproductive failure, um, and then in the most extreme, uh, death, which obviously is not good. Um, and so, uh, the the I guess the, the good thing about these strong seasonal cycles is that they are predictable. And so we know animals evolve lots of coping strategies for dealing with this. They can hibernate um, uh, and and change strategies. They can eat different things. They, there's lots of different ways that animals cope. They can store food um, and they can migrate. So uh, birds are highly mobile and that allows them to really uh, move into an area and utilize this big, huge pulse of resources and then get out you know, and go and get tough um, and leave. And so lots of um, birds have evolved this strategy. There are um, almost half of bird species on earth are migrants. Um, there's 5,000 species of migrant bird um, where they move at a particular time of year. They make use of those pulse of resources to breed. Um, they might mulch, replacing their feathers, and then move back out and go somewhere else that's better in the winter. Um, and so, uh, but what I want to also emphasize is that these things are challenging and a lot of animals 
Uh, there's a lot of variability in whether or not animals survive even this, even like a plan, you know, <laughs> event that they can prepare for. Um, but unpredictability is um, potentially much more challenging and results in a lot more uh, mortality. So this is just some examples of unpredictable events. So um, storms obviously are a big one. Um, you could have heat waves that are equally as challenging to survive. Um, and some that are a little less obvious, I think, to us, this penguin chick, for example, uh, it has historically not rained in Antarctica um, for a long time. And so, uh, but with, and so chicks did not evolve to have waterproof effects. So, so um, as the winter, or as conditions are warming the poles, they're seeing rain events now at a time when it used to not rain. And um, the chicks are suffering because of that. They're getting wet um, and we're seeing more mortality. So even things that we think should be better, it's warmer, <laughs> should not be better. <laughs> um, we'll see later on that it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily easier or better. And of course, this is not news to any of us here that these um, weather events, these extreme weather events are on the rise. Um, and so we're seeing more, both more frequent and more extreme versions of those events. So these are things that might be pushing animals to their physiological limits. Um, but we honestly don't know that much about a lot of species physiological limits. Um, or what kind of tools and adaptive responses animals might be able to use to survive these events. Um, and usually when you incorporate physiology and flexibility into your models of whether or not animals will survive a particular range, it improves the chances that they'll survive. So it's important to know like how far can we, how far can we push them um, and have some of them do okay and, and still live and pass on their genes to the next generation. Um, so these kinds of unpredictable, these are two that happened in our region. Uh, I don't know if you remember that giant ice storm we had in 2021, it brought down tons of trees. And that's like everything looked like that, you know, thick cover of ice. Those kinds of events are catastrophic for small animals that have to find food. It's now two inches deep in, in ice, you know, and they have these really high metabolic rates. They need to eat a lot of food in a day. So we expect that these kind of things will lead to pretty high mortality. Um, obviously, the fires, the big fires in 2020, that led to some research that I'll just briefly uh, mention today, but not really get into. Um, but these kinds of events can cause high mortality. But one important point is that not all individuals die, even when there's these giant events. This is one in France, uh, 20,000 birds, shorebirds washed up um, on the shore. Uh, after this giant storm, but some of them survived. And I'm really interested in that difference. What did they do? Or what was it about them that allowed those individuals to survive something that a lot of other individuals did not? So in my lab in general, these are some of the topics that we um, research. So we're interested in what are the actual energy costs of dealing with these kinds of events? How much does it cost to survive a storm in terms of energy? Um, what are different adaptations, both behavior and physiology, that might help animals to survive uh, tough times? And then uh, what are the, what's the kind of resulting fitness? What's the survival? What's the reproductive success for animals, individuals that use different strategies? Um, and and you know, what are the environmental contexts that they choose to do different things? But by definition, <laughs> studying unpredictable events is unpredictable. It's really hard logistically. We can't plan for it. Um, it's difficult to find, catch, and study animals during these kinds of things. Um, and so it's one big challenge. And uh, we use a combination of both field and laboratory approaches to try to study these things. Um, and these are, I'm just showing kind of five different um, categories, I guess, that we uh, that we study in our lab. Um, and I'm going to start off by talking about the first one, food shortage, and uh, what some of the adaptive responses that uh, that this my study species, my target species, use. 
Um, so uh, I want to start and introduce you to Red Cross Hill. This has been one of my best feathered friends for the last 20 years now. Um, and these are uh, small songbirds of finches. Um, and they have this unique morphology, that crossed bill, that allows them to open the scales of conifer cones and extract the seed. Um, and hopefully this video, little video will work. This is a little juvenile that I just put a, um, a band on and, and he, juvenile crop are hilarious. They're unafraid, of, they're afraid of nothing. <laughs> and so he just kind of flew into a little tree and I, I walked over there and was filming him um, up close. But you can see how he'll kind of jam his jaw into the, the um, cone and then scissor the lower, it's, it's a little hard to see in this light, but the, the lower jaw scissors sideways and it pops the scale open and then they stick their tongue down and they get the sea out. So they have really unique morphology that's associated with that, like kind of lateralized to muscle, um, jaw morphology and everything. Um, and this unique adaptation has a lot of consequences for them um, that are fascinating to me as a biologist uh, because this is like this giant food resource when there's a good cone crop. Um, then when there's a big seed crop in an area, they have a lot of access to food and they're so good at getting it out. They can do some really unique things. Um, but it's also challenging in some ways. So the seed crops, this is a, a distribution of conifers in North America, green areas where there's a lot of conifers. Um, and uh, when they're abundant, it's great. There's this huge food source. But the problem is that where those seed crops develop is variable from year to year. Uh, and so it's hard to predict where the birds might find the next seed crop. And so they make uh, nomadic migrations where they don't necessarily, well, we don't even know how to find them. Right? How do they know when they're in Washington that the next seed crop is in Michigan? But they don't, we don't, it's still a mystery um, as to how these tiny little birds find these seed crops, but they show up in huge numbers, millions and millions of grass fields. Um, moving on continental level scales to find new seed crops. <clears throat> um, the nice thing is that it's uh, it's variable in where they occur, but it's not variable in terms of when. Um, and so when the seed crops are developing in the spring, they can move and try to find a new one. <laughs> and they hope that that seed crop will last for a year, um, but it doesn't always. It's also variable in terms of how long the seeds will stay inside the cones, and that's weather dependent. A lot of kind of dry, windy weather or wet, dress, wet, dry cycles will cause the cone to flex a lot, and that loosens the glue that holds those seeds in, and they disperse on the wind faster. Um, and so, when that happens, they might need to make movements kind of during a cone crop year to find food somewhere else. And so, they live with this this like high potential for food but also a lot of unpredictability in terms of where they can find it and then how long it might last. Um, and I just like to point out like the scale of the problem for this teeny tiny little bird. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking about like continental level, regional level um, food fluctuations and these tiny little birds that are you know, 20 to 30 grams. Um, and so when they make these uh, kind of emergency migrations, when they have to leave an area where the cones are kind of shedding all their seeds really fast, we call those movements eruptive migrations, and they're effectively an emergency situation. Where the food is dropping, they're not going to be able to stay, and so they need to leave. And um, theoretically, any species could make, and, and if they're mobile, potentially would make an eruptive migration. They would leave and find something better. Um, but it's really evident and, and common, I would say, in boreal species. So uh, most of these species are dependent on conifer seed crops, the exception of the cedar waxing um, that's following, nomadically following fruit crops. Um, but either way, you get these giant mass movements of birds um, moving in response to resources. Uh, but it, it offers challenges in terms of when and where to go. Um, because movements are, are risky. Um, and we don't just see this in birds. We see this in humans as well, in, in, in any mobile animal again. Um, and I like to bring this up here to remember that you know we're all animals making the same kinds of decisions. Do we stay or do we leave? 
And some people have to make really hard decisions about staying versus leaving. Um, you know, can imagine what it would take for you to decide that going somewhere else with not knowing you know, the route or the conditions on the route, if you're going to be safe when you get there. But that, but it's bad enough here at home, in your home, to make you put on a backpack and walk away. That's the decision that a lot of people are making. It's really an intense one. Um, so anyway, I just like point that out. Um, because again, these movements are risky for birds that are evolved to cope with this kind of unpredictability. Um, they might not have a lot of time to prepare for these long distance movements. They may need to survive on weird stuff, you know, not conifer seeds, while they're looking and trying to find food somewhere, and they don't know the habitat, right? they don't know what the predator landscape might be like, or there's a lot of benefits to knowing an area where the water is, where the salt is, all these needs you have to meet while you're performing like a long distance, uh, you know, uh, athletic feat <laughs> of endurance flight. <laughs> it's, a, it's a remarkable thing that they do. Um, so I've been interested in how do they make the decision to stay versus go? Um, what are the kind of physiology that underlies that? And what are the different kinds of cues that they can use to make the best decision they can make? Um, and so for that, I have to talk a little bit about stress um, because this we think is one of the important physiology systems that is underlying these movements. And so um, in the, when we're talking about food, when energy uh, requirements start to exceed what you're taking in, your energy intake, then that's kind of the physiological point that we say animal stress um, or the, in, in an energy context. It's a kind of a loaded word for humans um, because we talk about stress all the time <laughs> about our lives. And it is similar actually, activating similar systems. You can have psychological stress and you can have physiological stress. Um, and in this case, we're talking about energy um, and then actually like food balances. Um, so when a, the brain detects a stressor like uh, shifting energy intake rates or uh, you know uh, an exam or something that's that's you know causing anxiety, um, there's a hormone pathway that gets initiated by the brain. And it results in elevation of this hormone, corticosterone, in birds, and we it's cortisol in us. Probably heard of this one. Um, and, but what it does, it's it's really an anti-stress hormone. The, the point is, it's adaptive. It's trying to help uh, to your body cope with a stressor. And so it tells energy storing cells to uh, release energy into the blood. So you'll you'll have this kind of pulse of fats and proteins and sugars released into the blood so that if your muscles start using it, um, it'll be there, right? It'll be ready. Um, it'll uh, inhibit things that aren't necessary for survival, like reproductive drives, for example, um, and promote survival. So it's really like an anti-stress anti survival kind of response. And so when I was thinking about cross build and food and eruptive migrations um, as a graduate student now, come a long time ago, <laughs> um, I just asked the question, well, if this system underlies the response to food instability, um, then if I food restrict birds in captivity, then we should see increases in this hormone and changes in behavior. And when I did that experiment, um, that's what we saw. So these were captive cross bills. Um, and giving them a mild food restriction caused this, this hormone to elevate. It also caused um, activity levels to increase. So it supported that initial hypothesis. But when I ran this experiment, um, and this is like one of these random decisions that you make as a scientist that end up changing your whole career, <laughs> which this did. This, 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 what I'm, the story I'm about to tell you is why I got a job at OSU. Um, but I was thinking about the fact that this is how you find prospects, okay? not alone in a cage responding to food, but in a group. And we think that uh, maybe not this big of a group, but they, they do have these small stable groups that they know and travel within. And so there must be some aspect of social cues, communication, and decision-making that's happening on a group level, right? Not just 
not just what one bird is experiencing or thinking or feeling. So even solitary animals, um, public information, social information, it affects lots of different things. Uh, it's really well known in reproduction, but uh, even, even animals that are super solitary still use social information from other individuals to, to decide how to do things. Um, so when I ran this experiment, um, I formed pairs where I had either pairs that could see and hear each other that were well-fed, pairs that were both food restricted, or pairs that were mixed. Um, so I gave this focal bird here a circle, either um, a well-fed neighbor or a food restricted neighbor. And then I asked, uh, or I measured, you know, does that affect their stress response? So the physiological stressor is the same, but their social cues are different. And I found that if they if there was a focal bird that had a neighbor that was also food restricted, they had this much larger hormonal stress response to the same food stress. So clearly the social cues were impacting how this stressor is being processed and then what it's doing to this really important hormone that might change behaviors and change decisions. Um, and when I dug a little deeper with a colleague at University of Edinburgh in Scotland, we discovered that those social cues are so strong that they're even changing things about the brain that, that like control that whole system. So it's changing, this is a port receptor expression in a, in a really important control region of the brain and the hippocampus. And what it means is that this, it dropped, if you had a, if the bird had a food restricted neighbor, they had less of this hormone receptor. And from what we know in mammals, this probably means that it's really sensitizing the HPA axis, this hormone axis that controls stress hormones and making it hyper responsive. So just much more responsive. And so it's, it's effectively priming the brain to respond strongly to a stressor. So that got me thinking, well, why? Like, that's a big thing, right? To have something that's happening to somebody else affect your brain and your stress processing. Um, and so I started thinking about hypotheses for why that should have evolved um, and came up with a few potential options of because they're moving as a group, it could enhance group cohesiveness, allowing neighbors to kind of influence your stress physiology to bring you know, birds closer together in terms of uh, how they're processing the environment. But you could also look at it from an individual viewpoint and say, well, maybe uh, this just kind of helps young animals or poorly performing animals to better assess the environment. Um, or maybe this is kind of an early warning system and birds that aren't doing well uh, are kind of warning <laughs> birds that are still doing okay. And so that's the direction that I went with it with another experiment that I did more recently here at OSU, um, where I had, again, these pairs of birds. And so the star bird is the focal bird. That's the one we're kind of most interested in. And we gave them a neighbor. Um, and then we had um, basically a six day experiment. So it's quite fast. Um, and in the first three days in this group, we probably call parallel social information, they had the same food and conditions at the same time. First three days, everybody's well fed. Second three days, they're both food restricted. That's similar to the last experiment I did. Um, <clears throat> but then I gave another group, uh, remember we're interested in the star bird. So in the first three days, the neighbor was food restricted. So now it's getting social cues that are kind of, you know, that are like an early warning. And then in the second three days, it is food restricted. So basically it had this kind of warning, this predictive value for the social information. And then we had birds that were controls and kind of well fed all the way through. And what we saw, so I was curious if this situation would um, would prime them, right? If they would then do better when they got food restricted than if they didn't have that warning. And that's, we found that that, that was true. So the control birds, this is just the change in mass. So the further the bar drops, the more mass they lost when I restricted them. And the birds with the predictive warning are in blue. And you can see that they lost less mass, in fact, about half as much as when they got the same restriction, but they didn't have any warning. Um, and so we think that the this, this influence, this um, 
change in the stress response is really allowing birds to prepare for potentially challenging times that are that are coming. So they're, they're paying attention to their neighbors. Um, and so then, of course, I was interested in, well, how? How did they say half of the mass loss? You know, what, 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 what happens? Um, because the way that we did the food restriction was we gave them two 45-minute periods to eat in a day. So what happens when you do that to the birds is they're used to having food all the time in a pup, you know, very easy to get. And then all of a sudden it's gone. And then it's there. And then it's gone. And then it's there. And they're like, what? You know, so that the mass drops um, because they haven't, they, you know, they're, they're not expecting this, right? So their mass, their body mass drops. And then they get a little better at realizing, okay, when the food's there, I can eat a lot. Um, and they'll improve over like the next week. So I was curious, well, maybe the birds with the warning did that better and faster, you know, and, and they, they maybe did a little bit. So the food starts high and then both of the food restricted groups are the dark lines that drop. So they're, that's showing that yes, this imposes a pretty big kind of, you know, a change in their food intake. And then they're both improving, but the birds with predictive warning maybe improved a little bit. But what I want to point out is that this point, <laughs> uh, day one, they ate the exact same amount, but they still had a 50% difference in their mass loss at that point. And um, we looked at activity levels as well, and it, it, it doesn't really explain it that much. Um, and so this is the point where I, I'm, I actually was looking at these data like real time, and I'm laying in bed thinking about, hey, they saved mass, which was awesome. I'm so excited that that happened. But they ate exactly, like the exact, you can't even tell that there's two points, like the exact same amount of food. And the physiologist in me was thinking about ways that that could have happened. Like, you know, an activity was an obvious one. They could have dropped the activity more. I couldn't look at that right then. Um, but I knew from my work in the migration field that birds have very flexible digestive systems. They can, they grow it and it gets this, they get these giant intestines that they can process a lot of food with when they're getting ready to migrate and they lay down all this fat, sometimes half their body mass in fat, and then they fly, right? So they like get really fat. And then they fly a long distance, you know, journey. It's an impressive thing that they do. And they burn that as they fly. And they also digest the intestine back down while they fly. And then they land and it takes them a few days to replace them. And so I just knowing about that and how flexible birds are, um, and the fact that we weren't allowed um, to release some of the birds. I decided that it was worth looking at their intestines. And I discovered that the birds that had the warning had much larger intestines. So basically the social cues are changing the brain and the digestive tract and allowing them to conserve body mass when this challenge comes along, all because their neighbor gave them some milk. So, I mean, that that is wild. <laughs> As a physiologist, like what? Um, so this is just kind of showing that that uh, what we know about um, the gut flexibility in migrants, and basically it's happening on kind of the same amount of time. Right? So they land, they, they get a big gut, they they fly. Obviously, they're not eating, so the gut gets digested, put back down, and then when they land on a stopover and they need to refuel, it takes them about three days before they can build it back up. And, and you start to see mass gain again. Um, and this was the same period of time. So, so I was like, well, how long, how fast can they change their gut size? But they can do it very fast when they, when they have the resources. So um, we found that these birds have, uh, you know, this kind of high sensitivity to social cues. And then that could be a really important adaptation for being able to cope with uh, such an unpredictable resource, um, where the social cues are really priming the brain to be sensitive to stress, to, to respond bigger and, and faster, um, which could help them. Uh, it protects their ability to assimilate nutrients, that's to get the nutrients out of the food that you eat into the body. Um, we, you know, we eat food that's not really in our body yet. We have to get it across the stomach and across the intestinal barrier to be able to use it, for our cells to be able to use it. 
Um, and that these things can allow for better outcomes. They conserve mass. They also, um, turns out, they, they better conserve their flight muscle size. And that's important for getting to lead. You need, you need that. You need your muscle <laughs> in order to fly. Um, and so uh, I also like to think about this as just another possible fitness benefit to being social and to flocking. And I think it's interesting that we see birds flock the most when things are hard. And this is always, you know, for a while, this confused um, you know, behavioral ecologist, like why would birds flock when resources are limited? Now they've got to compete with, you know, sometimes giant numbers of birds in, in your flock mate. Like why not kind of disperse and, and or defend? And uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, answers to that question. Um, but uh, this could be one of them, right? That there are benefits that we can't even see to being in a group and potentially having these social cues um, that kind of clue them in <clears throat> and prepare them for things getting tricky. Okay, so I am a professor and I teach often have like an hour and a half class. So I oftentimes incorporate a brain break <laughs> into my lectures. And I find it's very important for both me and for my students. And usually what I do during that brain break is play my students' song. <laughs> and um, uh, so I'm gonna do that for you too. And it's a song about um, about my research. <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of. It's kind of a topic about my research. Um, it's a song about the end of my PhD, really. And it's kind of like a field blues song, really. <laughs> um, because I had done a lot of field work and I did a lot of field work alone. And which is why I learned to play the guitar. I would have never done it if people could hear me. <laughs> but I was in the woods alone and waiting for birds to come down to a net. And so I had a lot of time um, to play the guitar. And but towards the end, it was um I was ready to be done. I was ready to graduate. <laughs> Um, and I wrote this song about uh, being in the field. So I think the only thing that's possibly confusing is Batman is my dog. Um, <laughs> and June was one of the way that we catch these birds in the wild is we have live birds that are basically pets. You know, they live with us in aviaries at OSU. And then I take them out in the field and they call to the wild birds. And that's how we can attract them. And actually, catch them because these are canopy species. We would never. Well, I actually spent three weeks up in Mount Adams trying to catch crossbill without a decoy, and um, had to, I tried catching a house finch as a decoy. I tried all this stuff, um, and it took me three weeks to catch my first bird. And then when I had one, it took me three days to catch forty more. That's the difference. So anyway, highly safe. All I have to say that's who Jimmy is. <laughs> Sorry. Hard to get up, Candace. Well, small and red, big to men, they wander in the cockpit's home to spend. And all I can do is follow them, try and remember how it was back then when I had a home. Well, it cost me a part of the pick up truck, and weeks in the rain down on. Lord knows why I can't follow them. I got even worse when my dog joined in. I no longer was alone. I have to tell you, I want to go home. Well, normal life again. It's been fun, but it's time in. Been ready, been back again. And I want to go home. Well, I know the girls like the back of my hand. Certain seeds that lived on the land. Same night, family in June. Made a few friends on the road to some power of the but the mountains wait patiently to catch a little bird for a PhD. Then heading down south to be with him. Try and leave in one place again. Make ourselves home. Now I tell you, want to go home. 
<laughs> Usually, you can feel free to rejuvenate it. It's nice, have music. I also teach um, neurobiology, actually, behavioral neurobiology. And music, it really does, it is a very potent stimulator and, and it, it can completely change people's ability to like listen, you know, and, and actually absorb. So, anyway, there are there's reasons besides just fun. <laughs> It also helps me connect, connect more with my students. So um, I like to do that. Anyway. Okay. So now um, I'm going to move into a story about storms. Um, and here, you know, we frequently, you know, assume the position <laughs> in your raincoat or your umbrella while you're walking through wind and rain. Um, birds do the same thing. And birds, of course, are small and they're endothermic. And this kind of a thing is really hard for them. Um, they lose a lot of body heat uh, to the environment. This is the same way we lose body heat to the environment, but because they're small, they have low thermal inertia. Then they, they, they lose they have more surface area compared to us. And so they lose a lot more heat. Um, and you know, some of the big ones are an evaporative heat loss just through like um, breathing and talking. Uh, thermal radiation, just radiating away from the body, uh, which the plumage is trying to minimize, right? So the, the feather barrier minimizes that. And then convective heat loss when it's windy, that, that like just massively accelerates uh, the loss from thermal radiation. Um, but birds do have, uh, of course, evolved um, <laughs> ways to cope with that. So, um, we, they wear their raincoats and their puppy coats at the same time. Um, and they can lay those coats flat, right? Put their feathers down. Um, and that provides us a smaller insulative barrier on a warmer day. And then they can puff it up when they're cold. And this bird looks super silly. <laughs> um, and that bird is, is probably in trouble if they're, if they're puffing up that much. It's usually not a, not a great sign. Um, but okay, they might make it. Um, so they can change their insulative boundary layer by flexing their feather muscles and increasing the air um, barrier that's trapped there. Um, but it's challenging, especially like places that are wet, like, like us, like where we live, because feathers are also the raincoats. And during heavy rain, they have to lay them flat. They've got to push them down because that slips the rain um, and prevents their downy feathers underneath those outer contour feathers from getting wet. Because if they get wet, they lose all insulin ability. And now you affect your, your that bird will be um, well toast, right? <laughs> They're not going to make it. Um, and so it's really important they stay dry. Um, and so there's this challenge there then between they lose their insulative air barrier when they have to do this, but they stay dry. And so um, wet, cold rain can be quite challenging. And we know that winters are warming, so we're getting a shift, um, which we think should, should, should be easier for thermal regulation if winters are warmer. But the problem is that across much of, the, um, of North America, we know that winters are also getting wetter, or at least there's more extreme rain events that are happening. Um, and um, it's over the next 30 years, we're going to lose a lot of snow. So we're going to have a lot less snow and a lot more wet rain. Um, and I'm interested in that uh, because I think, I think this probably just came out of like, you know, being a field biologist in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> it is cold when it's wet and rainy way colder than when I'm in Jackson, Wyoming, and it's minus 10. It doesn't feel as cold as when you get warm. You know, that wetness really amplifies heat loss. So um, I actually just got a big grant to, to study this in birds. Um, and we're trying to describe the real-time energy costs of storms in birds. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. And determine how do birds invest in different coping mechanisms for thermoregulation 
And how do they change your behavior? And then again, what are the consequences of all those choices? Um, because they are effectively, many of them are choices. You can invest in, you know, in this uh, strategy or in that strategy, but usually not both, unless you're a superstar. Um, but one of the challenges is how to measure energy in wild birds. And the way uh, that we do that is using these super tiny, they weigh a half of a gram, um, radio transmitters that uh, this genius, um, Jim Cochran, and his father built, they still built them in his garage <laughs> in Chicago. Um, but he has figured out a way to manipulate the output of the radio based on the heart rate of the bird. And we can then record that signal and filter it. And we get things like this where we get a heart rate of a bird who's out, like living, you know, out in the wild doing its thing. Um, and there, there have been other ways historically to measure energy through doubly labeled water, where you inject it, and then 24 hours later, you need to get another blood sample. So it requires you catch a bird twice. And you just kind of have like a 24 hour estimate. You know, there's no subtlety in terms of what's the bird doing at that moment and what's the, how's the heart rate responding. So I love these transmitters because we can study like point events, you know, predation attempts rainstorms, you know, sunbursts, whatever, whatever it is, we have that level of detail, you know, literally second to second. So this work um, I've done over the past uh, 12, 15 years in Grand Teton National Park, awesome place to work, <laughs> um, and very different in summer and winter. So the, the shift is like 80 degrees on average, um, but yet they're there and they're using the same seed crop in the same place. And so this gives us a really powerful um, comparison to be able to look at how birds are changing their behavior and costs and whatnot um, in, in this place. Um, one of the things I guess I haven't mentioned yet is that crossbills, because they're so good at getting conifer seeds, they can breed in the deep winter. So, and I'm talking like February. So it's minus 10. And there's a mom sitting on a nest, you know, protecting eggs, and the male is working really hard to feed her because if she gets off, it would her to the bees. So um, it's really impressive, and it's one of the things we're interested in with this project. But so with uh, kind of some blood, so we take a blood sample when we catch the bird, we put the transfer on, we let it go, um, and then we follow them for at least um, 48 hours on foot, and from the blood data and just from having the bird and we can look at its body condition and weigh its mass and all those things, we can learn a lot about what, you know, what's happening to the bird. We can look at um, parasite load in the blood sample. We can look at hormones and metabolites and all these things about its physiology. Uh, we can look at the bird. This is it probably looks like a really weird picture, but that's the breast of the bird. Um, and it's all, it's lost its feathers and it has water in there, and that's a brood patch. That's what the, um, the bird will sit on the nest with and keep the eggs warm. <clears throat> and then we can, of course, we have weather stations where we can measure what the weather conditions are like and get an idea about from a regulation expectation of the cost. Um, and then we're following them. We're wearing GPS you know, uh, units. And so as we try to stay with the bird, which we can't always do, <laughs> they fly over things like rivers. We're like, hey. um, but they usually come back. They, they do have kind of a home range. As you can see, these are two different birds um, in around the kind of Neary Center in, in Grand Teton. Um, and we can measure uh, home range size from those GPS tracks. And then we can, um, we can watch them and because they're seed eaters and they're up at the tops of the trees, they're up there. We've got a scope on them and they're pro every time they, they try to eat a seed, they spit a hole out and we can count those. We can actually count seeds per minute of effort, which is insane. Like you don't get those data from birds. That's really hard to get. Um, so it's, su it's a super cool system. Um, and the other thing that the nature of the radio is their continuous tone. And so we can actually hear anytime the bird moves. It makes it really easy to find them when you're a flock of, you know, 50 birds in a tree. Your eye, because you're listening to their activity, 
your eye will go right to that bird that just fluttered a little, you know, or just flew. You're like, Whoop, there it is, you know, and then you put the scope on it and you can get your foraging data. It's a, it's it's cool, it's really fun work, but it's really hard work. Um, and not the least of which is because they're fast. <laughs> You're just sitting down to like try to get your pack open and like have a snack, you know, and then you hear it because you can hear it. They, and you know that they're flying and they don't stop. And you're like, crap! You know, it's <laughs> right. Because you only get about a quarter of a mile of, re of uh, detection. So you've got to stay pretty close. And there were many birds when I was just walking in the, the, the last known direction and hoping that I'd find it. And some of them I never found again. They were just gone. Yeah, I had hiked for days trying to find them. Um, and they were gone. Anyway, so I'm in this kind of storm project. I'm really, uh, really interested in thermoregulation and how much it costs for them to maintain their body heat in these different environmental situations. And this is what uh, the data can look like. So this is the beats per minute on the y-axis. You might notice the scale is, you know, they're hovering right around 600 beats per minute. So we're more like 60 at rest. Um, so they have these really high metabolic rates, really high heart rates. Um, and that can get into the 1200s when Cooper's hot tries to get in the um, And that's kind of a normal level for a hummingbird. You know, they, they say you can't even hear it. Um, I can barely hear, in fact, probably couldn't hear 600 beats per minute. You can barely hear four or 500. That's getting to the level of human, the human brain can't process a rate that's faster than that. Um, but right around four or 500, you can kind of, you can just barely tell that something's fluctuating in the signal. Um, so you can just kind of hear it. But anyway, um, what the kinds of things that are useful is, uh, it's hard to see the shading here, but uh, nighttime is starting about 1900 hours. Um, there's, a, there's a subtle shade there. Um, and what you can see is that, uh, first of all, the heart rate, the variability decreases because they're just sitting. Um, and second of all, uh, we see the heart rate is elevating. We can ask why when we look at environmental conditions. And here is um, probably the, the, ex, the ex explanation that temperature is dropping a little bit. And we're seeing just kind of this parallel increase in heart rate to meet that imposed thermoregulatory cost. Um, and when we compare all of the samples um, for the 40 or so birds that have uh, tracked now, we see that the heart rates actually peak right around zero. Zero to five is the peak of that line. And it's weird to me that as you get down to minus 20, the heart rate is dropping, right? It's, it's actually not, and it's not dropping as much as in the summer. Right? And so in the summer, they, they have less cost when it's warm. Um, but effectively, there's something about that zero to five degree range that is expensive for birds. Some of these points are really high. Um, and this, some of those high points can be explained by this <laughs> day, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. um, this was like in March um, and it was minus five. One day there was a big snowstorm, it rained uh, or it snowed like six or 10 inches that day. And I have notes down here in my notebook, you know, I'm like writing in, in the notebook. Um, and then the next day it warmed up just to one degree Celsius, okay, so just above freezing. And it was still raining like hell and it was super windy and it was awful, like awful. I remember sitting in the bird, there's birds up there in the tree and I can hear it shaking and kind of, you know, you could tell it was getting wet. Um, and I was just like, you know, <laughs> bundled up like this with the receiver just being like oh this is the worst job in the world <laughs> but you get those moments and make it all but anyway it was really cold um and when we looked at the heart rates um that's the blue line you can see that that increase in temperature combined with the precipitation that's happening caused the heart rates to just skyrocket I mean, those are over a thousand beats per minute and that was sustained, you know, over the course of like an hour. And that's crazy. That's a huge cost. So we've gotten more interested in this. And we know that birds have mechanisms they can use to be able to produce more body heat. So um, if you look, if you, um, you can measure what's called summit metabolic rate by giving them a cold challenge 
and then watching how high they can get their uh, metabolic rate to meet it. So um, if they're warm acclimated, they can't reach a super high level. But if you give them time to acclimate to cold conditions, they do a lot better. And that's literally reflecting them building different proteins and whatnot in their cells so they can make more body heat. Um, and so birds can regulate how much they kind of invest in heat production. And we're interested in that. And basically, it's well described, cold does this. Nobody has asked if rain does this. And so that's what we did a, a big experiment where we house birds in cold conditions when it was dry or when it was wet, and in warm conditions when it was dry or when it was wet. Um, and that is no easy feat. It was a huge effort by two of my grad students and I. To, this is a giant walk-in environmental chamber that has now been destroyed in a remodel. It's such a loss. They didn't seem to have million dollars. They just tore it up because it's 30 years old. Anyways, I'm going to need to chip on my shoulder about that. <laughs> but we were able to do one experiment before they got to them. So we built these little insulation chambers that was mostly to protect them because it's windy in there. And we didn't want wind to be different or affecting the birds differently. And it's a, it's an environmental chamber, so it, it's loud. And so we wanted to, to shield the birds acoustically too. So they're in there with lights and, and whatnot. Um, and there's two birds per little chamber. And we had to then pipe in water and build a little irrigation system that could deliver um, water to a, a, the cage. And then we had to collect that water, of course, because it's like raining in the lab. Mm -hmm. So we had a gutter system and water would go everywhere. It was, it was so much work and we did it for four months. <laughs> Um, and so these are the two students who really ran a lot of it. Um, and this is what it looks like when it rains. So there's just a little um, plastic tray on top of the cage. And we like, poke, like literally just poke hold of the needle. Uh, we did a lot of trials to figure out how to rain realistically on birds. Uh, we tried vegetable sprayers, which were like, it was awful. Like that's not real rain, you know, that's like, <laughs> getting just soaked um but this really felt like rain to us you know it, it, it approximated it well and so we rained for half an hour a day on the, on just some of the birds um in cold and in warm conditions and then we'd ask okay hey, what is your heat production capacity and this is just showing the warm versus cold so uh across the months that we did the experiment in november through february um, you can see there's kind of a change a little bit. They increased their investment in January. Makes sense. It's really cold in January, usually. Um, and the cold birds are doing, they're, they're doing better, right? They're, in, they're investing more in their ability to produce heat. Um, <clears throat> so then, of course, we were, we were a big question. Does rain affect it? And what we found is that rain, the birds in the rain will increase their heat production, their investment in heat production but only in the cold conditions. So in the warm conditions, they, you know, there, there was a lot of overlap there. They didn't really uh, show anything different, but there might've been a subtle increase. Um, but in the cold, there was this big increased investment. And that suggests that rain is expensive um, to birds. They're having to invest in this and not in something else as a, you know, as a result. Um, and another really interesting thing, I've only shown November to January. <clears throat> we can see that there's this increase from November to January. And I should remind you, they're in constant temperature. So they're, the cold birds are at six degrees Celsius and the warm birds are at room temperature. That never changes. What changes is the day length. So there's clearly kind of responses to day length that are causing them to increase investment in January. And then in February, they decrease that investment, but not if they're in the rain. If they're in the rain, they keep it high. Again, suggesting that this is expensive. Uh, for them so just as a this is the average temperature in oregon bottoms out in january and then in february it starts to really increase as spring approaches um and so i think the birds are have primed by photo period to, to start releasing right they're, they're like okay spring's coming i'm going to disinvest in heat production and start getting ready for reproduction um but if it's raining they can't do that they're not doing so rain causes birds to invest more and for longer in heat production. And when they invest more, it can elevate their energy costs. 
Um, and it can cause them to kind of not invest in other things that they could be doing. And I liken this to, you know, when we build muscle, we have to feed it, right? It's expensive tissue. And so Gaston was eating 12 a night or whatever it is um, to, to you know, sustain those muscles. And so even at warm temperatures, that can be expensive. And you know, really only rain half an hour a day. Um, but we did see a big difference in how much food they needed to eat. Yeah, so the dash lines are the rain, and they're in both warm and cold conditions, they're much higher than um, when it's dry. Um, so I'll wrap up here. Cold um, and rain exposure is inducing the birds to invest more in their thermogenic capacity. It requires them to eat more food. And this all suggests that these kind of increasing rain in winters under, under impending climate change will be um, more expensive for birds that have to stay in those places. Um, and so it'll be really interesting. Our, our goal at some point is to um, inform models, you know, predictive models. How will this change what we think, where we think birds' ranges will shift, um, and how we think they'll shift, or perhaps birds have some surprises in store for us. This happens a lot when you think, no way, I'm not be able to live there. And then they, something happens, or they have some physiological tool that's hiding in the genes, oh. and you change the environment, and boom, shows up. You know, those things happen, and, and when they do, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Uh, should, should I stop here? I, I can very quickly talk about these other. We have 15 minutes, so it depends on. How many questions, questions there are? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll take like three minutes of these. So we're studying these other contexts too. We're doing, um, we're investigating the impacts of droughts in California on shorebirds and interested in their overwintering success and how water management strategies impact the shorebirds. Um, there's a lot of work on, on salmon and fish in the valley, but not as much on um, on shorebirds. And shorebirds are across the board in decline. So. There's a lot of interest in why. And we're hoping that investigating ecophysiology, the physiology of them might help um, because no other analyses are revealing any real clue. Um, fire. So I that 2020 fire had me really interested in smoke. Um, and uh, last year I was able to get a National Geographic Society grant. So look at this, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing on how smoke impacts birds. It's insane to me that there's nothing. And people are paying attention now, they're starting to be things published. Um, but I had some data just from my own field work um, on, on this left-hand graph and the blue is the smoke um, you know, profile across the year. And you can see these you know, big peaks, these big events that happen when there's uh, smoke from a mega fire kind of blows in. Um, and the black dots are showing body condition of juvenile crossbows. And what we are seeing is that there's a pretty um, tight correlation with um, smoke exposure, but also how recent the smoke exposure was and the juvenile body condition. Um, and I just spent a summer going to the campgrounds that everybody else was running away from <laughs> to try to catch birds and get more data from them about their condition, their um, hormones, their immune system, especially. Um, so the guy in um, Oklahoma who's going to run, uh, it's called proteomics, is where they describe all the proteins that have been turned on in the body. Um, and we'll relate that to smoke exposure. And our expectations are that mild smoke is probably completely fine, right? And so this is, this is some of the kind of ammo that people can use hopefully, eventually, to justify control births, even more, right? Um, and then predators, so urban environments. Um, we've got some projects looking at not actually direct mortality of urban predators on birds, but indirect. How does it change their behavior to have so many predators running around the landscape? Do you think, like, from an ecology point of view, what we're doing when we have cats? <laughs> it's really insane, right? We're taking like a top predator and we're feeding it, and then we're letting it go outside. <laughs> like, <laughs> no place in our community. You know, it's insane. I love cats, but like, man, we are <laughs> we are really pushing the ecology and urban systems that way. 
And so we're interested in just understanding more about that. And Dot actually is, she's like a cat nut. She loves cats. <laughs> and she's really interested in like the human side of it. Why do people decide to let cats out? What are, you know, what are they worried about? What are the, you know, is it just hard? Like, you know, what are the, those kinds of dynamics to try to learn more and maybe influence people to make different decisions. Okay, and that's my thank you slide. Mm -hmm. Funders and, and mostly students, people who have really contributed to a lot of this work.